Welcome everybody to this Radicalized Truth Survives breaking news special. I am so honored to bring in our friend Dee Batiste. She is a veteran, she's an activist, a community organizer, and she's gonna be talking about Blue Tennessee. Dee, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are so happy to have you with us. I was able to attend uh, the Blue Tennessee uh, inaugural you know, meeting uh, with the group and with the public, uh, and it was very exciting, and it was very personal for me, and can you tell our viewers why uh, it was kind of a victory lap for Betty Dangerous? That is because the way that I came about getting involved in Blue Tennessee is because I am a member part of the Betty Dangerous community. I was in a, a speakeasy with David Pepper and he was talking about it and it really, you know, sparked um, a lot of interest and excitement for me. And I was like, hey, we need something like that in Tennessee. And I just followed David around a little bit until um, I had an opening and found out that there was a working group here getting started. And um, Michelle Hornish, who is the executive director, was in the space where I was like, hey, I want something like this in, here in Tennessee. And so she hooked us up. And when the uh, person who is kind of our team leader here um, gave me a call, we just couldn't stop talking. I was like, I found my people. <laughs> <laughs> That's so beautiful. And uh, for those who don't know, I have a substat called Betty Dangerous. D is one of the inaugural members. David Pepper comes frequently to speak with our community on our Zoom events. And David was really talking about Blue Ohio and some of the things that they were doing. And one of his mantras is run everywhere. And in Tennessee, when I was listening to Blue Tennessee's meeting, there was something like 42. Uh, 44. Four, okay, well, why don't we talk about that? Because I think that that is where Blue Tennessee can really fill a void. Okay, so in 2022, we have 99 districts and 44 of those were uncontested. They ran unopposed, wow. so almost half. Wow, and and the thing is, so people understand when when there is no opposition, you get people like Mike Johnson, you get some of these candidates who become politicians, who become major infections in our body politic. So how important is it that this group has formed and that they're really mobilizing people to run as Democrats in Tennessee, even if they don't win? It's about the future and beginning that process now. It's very important because um, I personally have the experience of in, in 2000. Um, 22, uh, the county, my hometown county, um, I had a relative, uh, well, a couple who ran for different uh, seats, one for a school board and one for county commission. And the thing with the com county commission um, election was my cousin, it ended in a tie, oh, but wow. they actually, and they could have done a runoff and it wouldn't have cost them anything. And um, several of the papers wrote about it but because we had already had an infiltration of, they call themselves there, the constitutional Republicans. Mm -hmm. So it's just another version of the Freedom Caucus and the, they're just very extreme with um, religion on top, you know, it's the cherry. And yeah. um, they flat out denied her the uh, runoff. Um, they had, they um, had, um, some violations of the sunshine law and, and nothing was done. And that was just the beginning. And I could see the danger and it infuriated me. And I, so I was like, you know, what can we do? Because I know like that was just one small town, my small town that I grew up in, but very personal. And I could see how that could be replicated in county after county after county. And so now what we have here, like for the first time, also in two, um, 2022, they actually um, split our city. I now live in, in Nashville, which is Davidson County. And for the first time, they split it up. They, I mean, they sliced it like a, you know, a Christmas turkey. 
Wow. You know, just the gerrymandering. So just slowly degrading our power, our voices. And, you know, I, I'm just not someone to sit back. So I just look for ways to see, like, what can I do? What can I do? And one of the things I can do is talk, talk, talk about it and tell people about it. So, you know, I've been talking about it ever since. Oh, I love it. Now, Hi-Fi, I know you have a question. I'm going to make one more comment. Um, advocacy Arena is something that you do weekly. I've learned a lot from that community is jumping in one time, the amazing people that I've met. But I think it's really important to note that you are a veteran. Uh, you have a family history of service. And how important is it for people to understand that progressive democratic voices are pro service people and that this is not something that should be uh, co-opted by the right-wing extremists. It's very important. And that is too something that's very important to me, my service. I'm very proud of it. I come from a family um, with a lot of veterans. We span all branches. The only one I, I can't find that we're covered in is the Coast Guard. And <laughs> I was inspired by my um, uncles who, um, you know, have a very proud service Vietnam vets with Bronze Stars, one taught at the mm -hmm. Air Force Academy, and they were my inspiration for serving. And it just so happens that the majority of my service was done in Germany. And I mm -hmm. think of it as my second home. I spent 10 years there. So I learned a lot about autocracy and dictatorship and fascism, um, mm -hmm. have a lot of friends and I have friends who still live there that, you know, are German. <laughs> wow. And you were able to really apply that to your and to inform your activism. High five. So one of the questions I have is, you know, you talk about things being degraded in Tennessee and I live in Ohio and things have been getting bad here in Ohio for quite some time. Um, however, I think the people are starting to, you know, after the recent debacle with uh, the abortion amendment yeah. and the Ohio GOP trying to mess with our, our voting. And of course we've got the first energy scandal, but one of our biggest things we have is an attack um, on our educational system. And it's been going on for kind of decades uh, are they doing the same thing in Tennessee or, or is the GOP attacking your educational system there as well? The, the school vouchers, the charter schools, the unaccountable educational institutions, et cetera. They absolutely are. And it, it is another thing that I'm very passionate about, because, as I said, when I started learning about fascism and and how it works, I understood instantly that, you know, um, education was one of the, you know, the judiciary and other areas they, they um, you know, take control of. But education was one of those key areas. And an uneducated populace is a very easy population to control and manipulate. Yeah. Bingo. Amazing. Um, I, I often think that because I, 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 I hear the propagandists, the American people want, the American people want. I hear Marjorie Taylor Greene, the American people. She acts as if she's speaking for the American people all the time. And the bottom line is that if, if the extremist uh, faction of the GOP cared about the American people, they would fund public education. They would fund uh, public health. They would, they would fund uh, and believe in science. And so this has been a multi prong attack. We just had Jason Stanley on and really the bottom line is, and he wrote how fascism works is there appears to be a very concerted effort to reduce us to peasants. And I think that so much of what blue Tennessee and blue Ohio and what we're doing here in uh, California, so much of what we're doing is pushing back on that, which really would allow uh, the entire destruction of our democratic uh, union. Like what we have here is an imperfect democracy, but we, we have to fight for it or we're not going to get the reforms we need. Absolutely. And, and, and they're going for it um, in the education system because, you know, um, they are literally choosing to indoctrinate our children and they're not being quiet or, coy about it. They are straight mm -hmm. up. De Betsy DeVos yeah. comes here a lot. Um, oh, our governor in his State of the Union address 
last year said like one of he made one of his goals um, of creating can't remember the number now, but I want to say something over 50 charter schools here. And then Betsy DeVos chimed in in one of their um, big donor meetings that she wanted them to be religious. Um, and so they have been working for a very long time. And, and this is, you know, like, you know, that, you know, here in the South, we're in the Bible Belt. And I will say Tennessee is like the buckle of that Bible Belt. Okay. So it's very easy for them to hone in on the uh, religious aspects and, and convince people that, you know, this is what the direction that they need to go in. You know, wow. they started with three counties, you know, trying to say, you know, they were troubled. They needed a lot of help. They just happened to be the most, the largest, you know, diversity areas of diversity, like Memphis, Nashville, and the Knoxville area. And so we had one year of that already. They they weren't satisfied. Now they're trying to do it statewide. Wow. I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing exposing this because listening to Blue Tennessee's, uh, you know, inaugural meeting really gave me incredible hope that once people see the stakes that they will jump on board. Um, there was something that happened really big in Tennessee that put you guys on the spotlight uh, last year where Republicans um, thought they could overstep just uh, one little bridge too far. And can you remind people of that moment? Because I think that really turned, uh, you know, the national attention and conversation around Tennessee. It absolutely did. And of course, we were all horrified that it happened, but they expelled three um, members from um, the state house. Two of them happened to be black and another one um, was a um, white woman out of uh, the Knoxville area, but she was very supportive of them. And, and it was so undemocratic, you know, so that got the national spotlight turned on. Um, and I was very glad because like I said, the year before I had watched something very undemocratic occur in my own County. And I did have a reporter that would come in and write about it, but he's just a local NPR reporter. So I'm happy that national um, attention is being paid and that they continue to. And it bothered them because you know what? When they started the session this year, they actually limited the access to the media. Like they oh. um, only so many can come. Um, they um, and only so many citizens can come uh, to the legislature. They actually have to get a ticket from their legislature. So you wanna wow. talk about, you know, silencing people's voice? Wow, wow, high five. Are enough, are enough people, I mean, I, I when I look at most states and I look at the cities, cities are pretty diverse, people are integrated, uh, you know, they're generally progressive in cities. It's really in the kind of, rural small town areas where I see a lot of the hatred and the support for fascism, how will blue Tennessee address those rural areas and try to get the message out? Look, you know, I don't know what you've been told about the democratic party, but we're not, you know, baby killing blood drinking cabal of Satanists. Right. We just want better. And, and how do you overcome that? Well, see, here's the thing. And this is, you know, I'm going to be kind of paraphrasing uh, something that David um, Pepper talks about a lot. And that's the fact that in a lot of these places, the people are running unopposed. So they can be as extreme as they want to be. And when they have someone, an opponent, it forces okay. them to, it, it forces transparency and accountability. And here's the thing that I know from personal experience, like even though people like to think the people in rural areas, even Republicans are really, really extreme. I know personally that they're not. There are a lot of normal ones. You know how I know? Because I used to be the administrator, I used to be the mayoral assistant to our city's mayor, who was Republican, who used to be a state senator. And they're not mm. all crazy. Yeah. And so they know what's at stake. And I when love my, it. 
when my cousin ran, she actually had a lot of them. She would say that they would see her in the grocery store in different places and go, I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for you. So people get it. And we yeah. just have to, how Blue Tennessee helps is it forces the conversation because what happens a lot of times, like her campaign manager literally was afraid. Like she would come on my podcast and talk about it. And her campaign manager was afraid because she was um, a librarian. And she knew that she was putting herself at risk. And in a small town, that's scarier. Yeah. But then, you know, when you start finding out, you're knocking on doors and people think they're the only ones. And then, you know, like you knock on another door and they find out, no, you're not alone. Oh, they are too. So it just forces more transparency. It gives people a sense of, of camaraderie and know that they are supported and, and they're able to, you know, speak out without fear of being out there by themselves. Brilliant. That is so important. Um, it was very interesting listening to Blue Tennessee and listening to some of the organizers and activists um, because I, I know in 2022, when I was a campaign manager, my candidate became a councilwoman because she knocked on doors. She was told that the candidate who loses the most weight during the uh, during the run up to the election is going to win. And that, that means that's the person who did the most canvassing. And it was really interesting listening to um, some of the members of Blue Tennessee talk about their experience with canvassing because so many people had never had their door knocked on ever in the rural areas. And by the time that they left having these conversations, they not only secured a vote, they made a friend. And that's been my experience that canvassing actually is one of the most important tools that we have. And uh, and I think it's very, very cool what you said about how we tend to think that the MAGA QAnon cult uh, is every member of the Republican Party and unfortunately is a lot. But, uh, but for those who have not gone completely down the rabbit hole they are still uh reasonable and and accessible if you have a conversation with them that was certainly one of the big takeaways i had from blue tennessee okay so now uh let's just hear a quick sound bite from trey crowder who joined you at that event because i think this is a very important point i've always said people in towns like mine they do have some good reasons to be mad. They're just not mad at the right people or they don't point their anger in the right direction. In my opinion, that's what I think, you know, and it's like they blame everybody in towns like mine. They look at like the liberal hellscapes of cities like San Francisco and Portland or whatever else. And it's like, well, that's what you get. You know, that's what happens when Democrats are in charge, but things are terrible in Clay County too. And they don't, apply the same logic there you know what i mean and it's like well that's what we get because it's been a republican supermajority for however many years and however many decades and look how bad things are no that's also the democrats so it's the democrats fault when they're in charge and also when they're not in charge um so yeah i'm not really sure how that goes but i mean the factory there shut down in the 90s i always say you know the factory left forever and the pills showed up for good at the same exact time in the mid 90s and that kind of devastated the town forever but you know now like our hospital closed down three different times in the past four years and is currently still closed and you know because they can't take that socialist obama money or or whatever and things are not getting any better there generally and uh people are still mad but still not the people i think they should be mad at so it's disheartening He's obviously a brilliant talent, but he also made a very serious point there. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. He's right. And I mean, he was speaking of his particular hometown, but I know for a fact that that is what has occurred in my hometown and many of these small towns, you know, across the nation, actually, especially in the South. And, and it is a problem. And going back to something you know, Hi-Fi had said, I think that a lot of people, they're so busy just trying to survive. They're facing a lot of things. And so yeah. um, they may not talk about politics like we do or whatever, but they want their lives to be better, you know? And we want their lives to be better too. And honestly, the biggest mistake we made was to take those factories out and not put something back in to give people motivation and hope. Um, any final thoughts, Hi-Fi? Uh, because I'd like to end on a, a brilliant David Pepper clip. Well, I just, I think, I think a lot of people are viewing 
the political race in this country as Democratic versus Republican. And I would mm -hmm. like to argue that right now our politics are same people continued democracy versus <laughs> extremist fascists who are looking for some blood. I totally agree. Um, in fact, that's what I tell people all the time. Like, this is not a normal election. It is not Republicans versus the Dems, the red versus the blue. This is literally democracy versus autocracy. A hundred percent. I want to make sure that people know where to find Blue Tennessee. It's bluetennessee.org. I want to make sure they know where to find you and your Advocacy Arena podcast. We will include links on YouTube, but on Twitter, they can find you at Desia Designs, D-E-S-I-A Designs. And just one more thing about why you would encourage people to get involved in Blue Tennessee. Before you answer that, I will say that out of Betty Dangerous was born people who were so motivated by David Pepper that they began phone banking for Ohio began postcarding for Ohio. They made a difference uh, last year, an important difference. And how can we do the same for Tennessee? Well, you can, um, first of all, go to the website and, and you know, contribute, support us. Um, if you can become a sustaining member, um, we will be featuring monthly meetings and um, having different candidates. And um, I'm sure that we'll have some text banking and those types of things, postcards um, that will need to be mailed. So, you know, we could use all the help that we, you know, that we can possibly get because it does matter. Yeah. Yes, it does. And also the financial help is significant. That was one of the things that I took away from the Blue Tennessee meeting is that just raising a few thousand dollars for a candidate can be the difference between success and and, and not making it. Um, but I also want to say one of the really incredible things about listening in on what you guys were doing was meeting all the amazing people in Tennessee already involved in politics, already involved in community organizing. This was such a refreshing group of people. They are there in Tennessee. They need your help. Um, one of the political um, leaders in the state house there said that she had a bipartisan bill that the Republican majority would not even look at, even though it was something that she worked on with a fellow Republican. So That's I think the if we- grocery tax. Yeah, let, so, so speak on that for just a moment, because I think if we actually do encourage reporters to put sunlight on what's going down there, we can change some of this behavior. Yeah, she had, um, that would have been Afton um, Bain, and she had a bipartisan support uh, for a bill that would, because we don't have income tax here, we have uh, sales tax. And um, for probably the last decade, they give us, you know, a couple of months, a few months um, throughout the year where they suspend the tax. And she uh, and her, the person that was supporting her wanted to suspend it permanently okay. and it died. It went nowhere. Could, I don't wow. think they got a second motion on it. Wow. So these are the types of things that we can expose and put again, further sunlight on. Um, anything else that we didn't ask? I think this is a very important group. I felt very motivated and excited that the, future of Tennessee with just a little bit of support, just everybody doing a little bit more, people donating a little bit of money um, that we could actually have an impact on your state. Really, it does. It doesn't take a lot, you know, and like I said, if you, you know, one time contribution or to become, you know, a monthly sustaining member, it would mean it would go so much um Further, It would help each candidate do because we fund from the bottom up. I think you heard about the bathtub method. So the candidate that has the least gets the most. Um, okay. And that's where we start doling it out. And um, we talk about in terms of statistics, like it's like 36 cents um, for every voter can increase. Um, if we have that amount of money can increase the turnout by one percent. Okay. And, you know, one percent can turn things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi-Fi, anything else? I'm just thinking we need 
a group like Blue Tennessee in every single state in the union. And mm -hmm. we need it fast. Yeah, we do. Yes, I know. I can, I, I'm, I'm rooting for that. And we, our, our group will definitely jump on board and help support others as much as we can because, um, and, you know, Michelle has talked about how our each state um, you know, there's Blue Missouri and, and Blue Ohio. Each one started a little differently. But I think what was very unique about ours was like it was really, really grassroots like the others. They had some folks, big donors and people who could kind of jumpstart it. None of us had any money, but we had a lot of heart and grit. So we found ways to raise the money and, and get members really, really early. We did some creative things and, um, you know, we'd like to share those ideas with other people. I'd love to see one in every state. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is so beautiful. And I'm so, so grateful for all of that you do, all of your activism. And really what you just described is what really makes America. It is that true grit. And we need it right here on the pro-democracy side. And thank you so much for delivering it. Well, thank you for, you know, like I said, um, giving me an opportunity to be a part of the, your work and community. Like I said, you inspired me to get involved in something that I'm very passionate about and Yay. very dedicated to. So it's a, it's a collaborative effort. Um, I think Michelle says when um, we all do better, we all do better, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. That's so incredible. Dee, I'm so glad that you joined us today. BlueTennessee.org, Advocacy Arena. Let's go, Tennessee. So what we're doing by doing Blue Tennessee, like Ohio, is trying to take some of the resources that in recent, in the last several decades, basically only went to Senate and House candidates, federal races, and saying, and this is where I'll use my, my chart here, let's take some sliver of what, this is a pie chart, of federal money, Take some sliver of it to this and get it into state houses. And this is what this is what Blue Ohio Blue Tennessee does. And what I will say is that sliver may be the rounding error of a massive television campaign for that statewide federal race. But in this state level, that same amount of money is funding many, many races. And the amount of money it's funding in those races isn't a rounding error. In many cases, it's the largest amount they're, they're getting. It's massive value added. Mailers, you know, digital, if people will help people figure that out. Digital, all the things, it could be a big part of their campaign. So what does Blue Tennessee, Blue Ohio do? We make it easy for people to take some small amount of what they give and park it into races that have been, un, that have been overlooked for too long. And boy, does that money go a lot further in those races versus just, you know, one other amount of money in a $100 million race.